Yeah. Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library. I'm really glad that you're here with us tonight to uh, really preview a new documentary, Carter Land, and here's some discussion about the uh, the Carter presidency and what it was like, what it was really like, uh, uh, unlike a lot of a lot of perception. Um, but before I get started introducing our, our panel, I want to be sure and thank the Atlanta Film Festival for co-hosting this program and remind everyone that the film Carterland that we're discussing tonight will premiere on April 24th on the grounds of the Carter President. Center. It's being kicked off as part of the Atlanta Film Festival. So if you've already got your ticket, that's great. But if our talk tonight piques your interest, what you need to do is go to the uh, to atlantafilmfestival.com. You can get more information not only about this film, but other films during the, the film festival that uh, that I'm sure you're going to uh, to really, really enjoy. So uh, we appreciate you being here. One other thing, um, we we'll welcome your questions down. There's a task bar down at the bottom of the screen. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those as the, uh, the hour goes by. I'm delighted that we have the two filmmakers for Carter Land, Jim and Will. Patsis, the filmmakers, the founders of More Than Just Parks, an online source with everything about national parks and public lands aimed at protecting these places that for all of us uh, are wonderful places and protecting it not only for us, but for future generations. They are two Georgians who I think were struck by President Carter's, and we'll find out if this is right, struck by President Carter's. Um, setting aside of land, uh, like the Alaskan Lands uh, Act, um, but they believe that there's a misconception about the Carter presidency, and we'll find out uh, about that as, as well tonight. And we've got some people who, who have pretty good ideas about that, like John Alter. John, Jonathan Alter is a best-selling author. His latest book, his very best, Jimmy Carter, A Life. And I can tell you, it's an excellent book. I think because it treats President Carter as, as a real person so that you get a better understanding, not only of what he did, but how he did things, why he did things, the, the forces that that molded, uh, molded him and his decision. Um, and if you if you haven't had a chance to to see John's book, I'll give a little heads up. He's doing a virtual author program with the Atlantic History Center on Thursday this week. It's a great opportunity to see John again and hear him talking about the the book. He has spent a long time uh, with us at the Carter Presidential Library doing research, as the filmmakers did. He's the author of a couple of other books about President Obama. Uh, one about uh, FDR. He's a political analyst, a documentary filmmaker, TV producer, and a radio host, and and uh, just really, really good to work with. I'm just really glad John is here. Bob Strong. Bob is the William Lynn Wilson Professor of Political Economy at Washington and Lee University. He was a Fulbright Scholar. He was a congressional fellow working in the offices of Congressman Lee Hamilton and Senator Richard Lugar. In addition to teaching, Bob is the author of books on President George H.W. Bush and also Bill Clinton. And he wrote the book, Working in the World, Jimmy Carter and the Making of American Foreign Policy. Bob, we're glad you're here tonight. And finally, Steve Hockman. Steve is the director of research for the Carter Center and assistant to President Carter. Steve, Steve has worked closely with President Carter for gosh, some 40 years now, starting out by doing research and editing about President Carter's own view of his time in the White House, his book, Keeping Faith. Steve has assisted President Carter with his other books and articles, 
as well as doing research work at the Carter Center. So we have a wonderful panel tonight. Gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have you all here. Um, but I want to start with Will and Jim and why you all did this film in the first place. Yeah, well, thanks for yeah, having thanks me. For um, basically, for Jim and I, we grew up in Georgia. We came from a background of, you know, this idea that President Carter was a great guy, a great ex-president, um, but kind of with this notion that he was a either bad or failed or some sort of connotation that wasn't necessarily good about his presidency. Um, and Jim and I have done a lot of work in public lands, so we've done a lot of work with the Park Service, the Forest Service, etc., kept seeing his name come up time and time again. And we kept saying to ourselves, man, how has a guy who has done so much for the environment and for the natural world, how could he be considered a bad president? And so we started to explore this idea. And along the way, we realized that, wow, there's so much more to this story than folks know. Not only was he, um, his presidency terribly misunderstood, but that he really has done an incredible amount. And um, like John's book says, he really would have solved the climate problem had he been reelected. So it's this fascinating study into President Carter is what we came up with, our own learning and um, along the way. Jim what, Jim, what do you hope to get out of this film? And what, what do you hope changes people's perceptions uh, uh, when, when you and Will went together to put this together. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I think um, one of the things, it, it's kind of, there are two sort of main stories with our film. Um, one of them is kind of this uh, idea of, I think Jason Carter, when we interviewed him for the film, sort of put it really well, which was, he said that Jimmy Carter was the first millennial president. Um, and we thought that was just a really succinct way of talking about how this was a guy who was way out front on all of the issues that we're only just now confronting today, you know, talking about um, climate change, talking about racial equality, women's rights, you know, renewable energy and ethics in government, which is, you know, something that's really cropping up today. Um, <clears throat> so I think that was one of the main things. But the other thing is this idea of moral leadership. Um, I think that's something that particularly in politics is really difficult to, to accomplish and in our system can be very difficult. But I think one of the main takeaways we want people to leave our film with, and we're hoping that we're accomplishing is that the film sort of at its core is about moral leadership and the kinds of values that we should look for in our leaders. You know, Carter was the kind of person who would, um, he wanted to do the right thing. And you see time and time again throughout his term in office, he chooses to do the right thing regardless of the political cost to himself. And, and we find out, you know, that the costs were uh, tremendous. But you know, one of the things that uh, impressed me, the way you start your film is with uh, uh, Vice President Walter Mondale. And he, he talks about um, that Carter is thought of as a wonderful former president, but not not so much president. I'm just curious, John, your book talks about that and what was accomplished. Why do you, why do you think that is? Um, well, first of all, I want to uh, just thank the people on this uh, panel, you, Tony, for all the help you provided me when I was working on the book. I, I don't think I could have done the book without Steve Hockman, who uh, was just an enormous help to me all the way through and, and actually saved me from myself at the end by uh, correcting um, several factual errors that I had in, in my, uh, my early draft. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Robert Strong's work on Carter's foreign policy was very influential in terms of my own um, assessments of, of Carter's, uh, I, I think, uh, hugely successful for the most part foreign policy. And Jim and Will, you know, they interviewed me when I was first, uh, when I was still working on the book. And they, uh, in our, my conversations with them, got me focused late in the process on some environmental issues that I 
didn't know very much about. So I, I want to thank them too. Um, so in answer to your question, I, I think what happened was that Carter um, was a, a political and stylistic or performative failure, but a substantive and farsighted success. And, um, you know, journalists, I'm a journalist, we tend to assess these presidents in real time by how they're doing politically, how popular they are, how how well they do in you know managing all these often silly issues in Washington. And it's hard at the time to know how long lasting what they're doing is gonna be. And a lot of reporters have very little patience with, with the record. So, you know, there would be these bill signings every few weeks. Carter had, I believe it was 14 major pieces of energy and environmental legislation. Uh, and, and the press paid hardly any attention to it. And then in the second half of his term, he was swamped by events. Uh, the, I think everybody knows about the Iran hostage crisis and he, the hostages did come home safely, but it wasn't until just a few seconds after he left office in 1981 after Reagan was sworn in. So he didn't get them out before the election, which hurt him a lot. He didn't manage the politics within the Democratic Party well. So Ted Kennedy challenged him from the left for the nomination that was very harmful. And the economy was just a shambles, mostly because of, of just insane increases in, in oil prices in the 1970s that, that contributed in large part to this ruinous inflation. And then he appointed Paul Volcker to be chair of the Fed and Volcker uh, eventually got rid of inflation. Reagan got the credit for that, even though Volcker was Carter's appointee. But in the meantime, interest rates went as high as 19, 20%. Can you imagine trying to run for reelection when uh, you know interest rates are that high? So when he lost and he was crushed by Ronald Reagan, you know, Americans like a, a winner. And, and uh, they, you know, they wanted to kind of move into this new Reagan era that we're only now starting to come out of um, 40 years later. And uh, Carter, who always some, you know, seemed to draw a lot of criticism because as you, you know, as has been said, he did what he thought was right, not, was politi not what was politically expedient. Most of the time, there were exceptions to that. He, he could be politically expedient at various points in his career, but for the most part, he tried to do what was right. And um, that hurt him politically. And so this easy, lazy, completely inadequate shorthand, bad president, great former president, took root. So I think what's going on now is, and, and you know, Jim and Will's film is, is a part of this, and there are these you know, new books out by me and, and others. Um, it, you know, uh, Robert Strong was ahead of the curve on this, um, but at, at the time your book came out, uh, Dr. Strong, I, I'm not sure the country was quite ready to reassess Carter. I think now it is. So we're in a period now of, of considerable historical revisionism that's long overdue. Well, you know, uh, you raise, John raises a good point, uh, Dr. Strong. Um, your book is about Carter and foreign policy. And, you know, we've gone through a period where foreign policy was not necessarily done the way Jimmy Carter did it. And people have, have thought more about how do you want to relate to other countries? How how did Carter relate to other countries? What molded his foreign policy? Well, that's an excellent question because of course he came from a background where he hadn't had much experience in Washington. He hadn't had much experience on the international scene. Uh, but I was gonna uh, come back and uh, just make a quick observation. Um, Carter and the elder President Bush were born in the same year, 1924. Um, they both came up for re-election with pretty dramatic international accomplishment uh, and bad economic numbers. Uh, and a challenge uh, from the left 
uh, by Kennedy against Carter, uh, challenges uh, from uh, the right or the populist wings of uh, the Republican Party uh, against the elder President Bush. Uh, I think uh, the American public, uh, even when they recognize foreign policy success, and in Carter's case, there wasn't a broad public recognition that Panama was the right thing to do, but when they recognize public uh, success in foreign affairs, it's not the thing they vote on. Uh, they're much more likely uh, to vote on the pocketbook issue and how is the economy doing, or on issues that present themselves in dramatic but superficial fashion. The public was upset uh, about the long drawn out hostage crisis uh, with uh, Iran. Uh, and I think more than anything else in his final year, uh, that's what made it extremely hard for him to win a second term. Oh. You know, the thing that I think of is, is President Carter has often said, you know, we brought all the hostages home safely. Um, and that tends to get ignored in place of they were there for 444 days. That's right. And of course, he explains that that was his objective to bring them home alive. And he accomplished it. There were other people who thought that might not be the right objective, uh, that we should have taken a harder line uh, against uh, Iran, even if that cost uh, suffering by uh, the hostages or death uh, among the hostages. Um, Carter never accepted that. The objective was uh, to not humiliate or sacrifice important interests of the United States, but to bring the hostages back. And he does say, President Carter, from time to time, I wish I'd sent another helicopter. Uh, yeah. If uh, the rescue mission had uh, been successful, and it would have had lots of hurdles to pass after refueling, but had it been successful, I think that really would have turned around um, public uh, sentiment about uh, Carter. Yeah, and, Let me yeah. real quickly come back to your original question. Where did his foreign policy insights come from? <clears throat> Here's a part of the answer. Uh, I think uh, the Carter commitment to human rights, which was deep, genuine, and sincere, came from his own uh, experiences and what he witnessed in the transformation of race relations in the American South. He was a late leader uh, in that movement, uh, uh, famously making his statement at the beginning of his Georgia governorship that the era of segregation was over. But uh, he witnessed it. Uh, he experienced it within his own family. He saw what could happen when ordinary citizens were reminded over and over again by King, by demonstrations, uh, and then by legislation about what was the right thing to do. I think that shaped his thinking about lots of issues, including uh, world affairs, it's going to matter if we talk about human rights. Uh, and I think he deeply believed that. Steve Hockman, you have worked with President Carter for 40 years now. Uh, you probably, I'm sure you know him better than anyone else on the, the panel. Uh, first of all, how does, how does he feel about the thought that he's a wonderful ex-president his presidency is not this, not the same. And then, um, how when you worked with him on his book, uh, Keeping Faith, how did he view the success or failure of his own presidency? Well, uh, let me start out by saying that President Carter does get disturbed when people just say he's the greatest former president of all time because he thinks that that just emphasizes his post-presidency and doesn't talk about his presidency. And he's, he's proud of his presidency. I have to say sometimes that upsets me because I'm part of his post-presidency and I definitely believe he's the greatest former president of all time. 
And he that's pretty impressive compared with others of achievement like William Howard Taft and Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams. There are others that also did exciting things. But why, let, let's go back to what Will had said about how he grew up thinking that President Carter was a failure. Well, why is that? Well, my belief is that because President Carter was defeated, journalists and historians saw as their goal to explain why he was defeated. And they were looked through his administration and any little mistake became highlighted. That's what they talked about. Something like uh, Tip O'Neill not having a good seat before the inauguration, not him, but his family. And that became a big story that people always talk about. And yet Tip O'Neill and President Carter developed a great relationship. And he, uh, Tip O'Neill uh, became much more respectful of President Carter's staff as time went on. The fact is when I studied for my PhD orals, I went through all the presidents and I was amazed how George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, all of them made mistakes. But because they ended up well, they, the, the mistakes were not emphasized and that wasn't what most people remembered. But we're at a point now where we can say, okay, President Carter made some mistakes, but let's look at what he achieved. And that's what is an achievement of Will and Jim's uh, documentary. They do a great job in showing how President Carter achieved so much. And, and I'll give John, I give you credit too, and, and, and Bob. And now the Bob uh, has been at William at uh, Washington and Lee for many years. But before he went th there, he was a young man at University of Virginia, the Miller Center. And the Miller Center, as you know, uh, has a great study of uh, Jimmy Carter. And actually right after his administration was showing that he had achieved much and uh, conducted interviews with numerous people who had been in the administration. And I rely on it. I'm grateful for what Bob did and the other, his colleagues at the Miller Center. So it isn't as if there's nothing new, uh, or let's say this is all new. People have tried to say, yes, President Carter did have achievements. And President Carter, when he was writing Keeping Faith, um, memoirs of a president certainly talked about what he achieved. But the general practice was to emphasize the negative. And I'm very thankful that John has taken another view as well, because uh, he does, yes, he, he says President Carter made some mistakes, but he also shows the great achievements of the Carter administration. Well, you know, one of the things that comes to mind when we redesigned the uh, the Carter Presidential Museum in 2009, one of the things that was put is there's a wall that has listed a number of the achievements of uh, President Carter. And I think down at the bottom, it says something like, you know, he would, he had more achievements than a number of, of presidents during uh, during their time. And, you know, you walk by that and you start looking at things like the Department of Education and his uh, Alaska Lands Act, and you start thinking, oh, that goes, that goes back to Jimmy Carter. Um, I'm curious, Will, that's one of the things your film does, though, too, is it handles a um, number of things one after the other that, that President, uh, President Carter accomplished during his time there. Yeah, part of the film experience was, like I said earlier, Jim and I's own experience learning along the way about 
all of these things that President Carter achieved, we started with this idea that, wow, well, he's done so much for conservation. And that was really going to be the basis of the film. And as we went along and we went along and we went along, we discovered, man, he also, this Panama Agreement, despite what we had heard before, was an amazing achievement, you know. Um, we went to Camp David, then we saw that, man, uh, peace between the Middle East is a pretty impressive thing from a president. We went, and then it's just the millennial piece too. I mean, women's rights, racial equity, all of these things that people don't really associate with any president prior to, you know, the maybe President Obama, even these modern things they were there in the 1970s with President Carter. And so a lot of it for us was learning in this and you know everybody here was a huge part of it. But for us, it was just amazing. And we feel like that is the story that folks need to know. This guy was a visionary who was way ahead of his time, not to mention climate change. Well, Jim, don't you think that's one of the things that your film will do is kind of provide the tie for people between things that they take for granted now and didn't realize that it was Jimmy Carter that opened the door for women, for example, or uh, for minorities to be judges and, and things like that. It, it will provide that connection. Yeah, that's definitely um, one of our hopes. I mean, uh, in the film, <clears throat> we interview Governor Kate Brown of Oregon, and uh, she talks about how she was inspired by President Carter. You know, she was going to law school, and at that time, um, there, were, there were no female judges. I mean, there, I think uh, in the film, we talk about how there were, oh, what was it, four or eight, eight, of, yeah, eight. eight uh, female judges, federal judges in, in the history of the United States up to that point. And Carter started appointing all these, these female judges, ends up appointing uh, 40, um, and, uh, which was just, you know, it was unprecedented. And that inspired her to go pursue a career in law. And, and you know, she ends up becoming the governor of Oregon. Obviously, um, you know, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and all these examples. Um, so yeah, it is, it is about sort of tying that together. And, um, you know, this was a president who, who put solar panels on the roof of the White House in the 1970s. I mean, you know, no, nobody knows about this. And then, you know, President Obama comes in later and, and refits the roof with, with solar panels. And, and we, talk, we talk a lot about that. But yeah, Jimmy Carter did that way back in the 70s. And I think, uh, you know, one of the other things is uh, Andrew Young, Ambassador Young talks about it in the beginning of the film, which is Carter brings him in um, to take the the um, civil rights movement, you know, Martin Luther King's civil rights movement to take that abroad and really um, incorporate that into the United States foreign policy, which at that time was in shambles. Um, and so I think th those are the kinds of things, you know, we don't necessarily associate with, with a president from, from the 1970s and, and we really should be, we should look back and, and really look at his example as one to, uh, take forward? Well, you know, one of the things um, that, as, as Dr. Strong, I think, mentioned about Carter during his gubernatorial uh, address, mentions the time for racial discrimination is over, and that's a, a quote that is, is pretty well known. But the thing that I think really sums up his approach to government was something he also said in that uh, uh, address as he became governor. And that's the test of a government is not how well it deals with the, the well-to-do, the privileged and well-to-do, but how well it treats those who need the most and depend the most on government. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, Jonathan, that's kind of the, the whole approach that he had to, uh, to government. And it, I think it probably begins when, when he's growing up in, in rural Georgia. Yeah, um, just uh, on a couple of points that were made that might be a, a you know a little bit just before I address your question, a, a little bit confusing for people who uh, don't know much about Carter. You know, we've had some reference to Panama, and 
It sounds like that sounds like a kind of a distant issue. Panama, yeah, big deal. I mean, what did he do in Panama? But um, the Panama Canal is is the you know essential for global commerce, and uh, basically, if these Panama Canal treaties that two thirds of the country was against, and it required a two thirds vote in the Senate, the heaviest of heavy lifts. If they had not been ratified, if Carter had not been able to complete the treaties and get them ratified, it's very likely, and all the military people said this, that uh, saboteurs, uh, terrorists in Panama would have sabotaged the canal and we would have had to send at least 100,000 troops there. They'd probably still be there defending the canal so that global commerce wasn't shut down. And and uh, when you so sometimes there are these sort of pivot points in history that you don't recognize at the time or you hear Alaska lands. Yeah, OK, that's nice. He saved some land in Alaska, he saved some redwoods. He doubled the size of the National Park Service. You know, it made him easily the greatest con uh, uh, conservationist president since Theodore Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt didn't do things at the at the uh, uh, you know in uh, pollution end of it, so he he was great on conservation, but industrial pollution hadn't become a big issue. Carter, uh, just to you know give you, uh, we heard about the solar panels on the roof of the White House. Really important symbolically, Reagan took them down, uh, but while that was going on, there were all these substantive things going on, like like the first support for clean energy, for green energy in by the federal government, the first fuel economy standards and, uh, you know, and the first toxic waste cleanup. And what's so great about Carter land is that, you know, unlike um, some very uh, entertaining uh, films that have come out recently about discrete episodes in the uh, Carter administration, like his friendship with rock and roll musicians or his, you know, his role in the uh, Iran hostage rescue. This film takes a broad view. So you get the larger sense of the scope of these achievements, um, which, uh, you know, was a constant revelation for me. Now, I don't actually, in answer to your question, Tony, I don't actually believe he, he was a, a, a particular believer in a, you know, a really activist government. I don't think he really had the New Deal in his in his bones, in part because he worked a little bit for the New Deal uh, when he was a teenager. But uh, his father got very upset with agricultural policy. And he was in some ways more of a Theodore Roosevelt progressive Republican who believed in ethics and proper regulation you know, also balanced budgets and he didn't want to grow the size of the government. And he was also coming at a time when liberalism was kind of fatigued in the 1970s. So he couldn't have done, even if he'd wanted to, uh, what Joe Biden say is, is doing right now. The, the, the United States wasn't ready for that at that time, but he did see to go to Jim and Will's point, this moral dimension. And he really did believe, as Roosevelt said, that the presidency is preeminently a place of moral leadership. But in doing that, he never mixed church and state, much less than other presidents, despite the intensity of his own faith. And he understood where, you know, government didn't belong as well as where it did. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned the Panama Canal. I, I remember a book uh, by a former New York Times reporter that dealt with the Panama Canal and Reagan and the, the thrust was President Reagan uh, benefited from the Panama Canal debate because he opposed it, but he didn't have to face the consequences that would have happened had it actually failed. Uh, and so uh, Reagan comes out looking good. Carter comes out looking bad uh, with the, the public for a... Uh, a foreign policy that is really in the best interest of the uh, of the United States. And Professor Strong, isn't isn't that how he 
dealt with foreign policy, um, go by what works best for the country, not necessarily politically? Well, I think he did that often. Uh, and it's part of the explanation for why some people who've looked carefully see real accomplishment, others uh, remember him as uh, weak and decisive failed. I, you know, I, I think all presidents want to be remembered well. Once you've won the presidency, what's the next step? No one says, I want to be a great ex-president. People say, uh, I uh, want to be remembered. And there are different strategies for accomplishing that. Uh, and I think Carter belongs to at least one of the traditional strategies, build policy monuments. Uh, you might uh, have to knock some heads together to do it. You might do things that today are unpopular. Later on, people will see their value. Uh, but be like Harry Truman, uh, not that popular uh, when uh, he was near the end of his time uh, in office. Uh, but uh, later on, people saw, oh, uh, the NATO alliance, the Marshall Plan, the, uh, the real uh, accomplishments that he had, and uh, the way in which he set things up for later uh, administrations. He had proposals about health care. He had proposals uh, about uh, uh, other reforms that happened later. So it, you can be a policy monument builder, or you can be a reputation manager. You spend all of your time, uh, and we've actually seen something like this recently, uh, spend all of your time uh, watching what people say about you on television, uh, going after the enemies who say things uh, you don't care for, uh, and um, think constantly uh, about uh, whether or not you can win the next uh, campaign and all of the politics connected to it. A lot of presidents try and do both, it's hard. Uh, but Carter, I think, belongs to the group who was less concerned about spending time uh, on his reputation, spending time on his rhetorical strategy, and instead, uh, let's do some hard things that need to get done. Yeah, I am reminded of uh, President Carter after he left office and there were the discussions and Steve Hockman knows this better than I, that at one point he, he said he wasn't interested in building a monument to, to himself. Uh, and as one of our viewers pointed out, he wasn't in the marketing business of, of marketing himself. Is that right, Steve? I agree with that. I, uh, I, he does know how to market himself. Uh, that's how he was elected president in 1976. But once he got into office, he didn't believe that marketing was his, his role. Yeah, that, that's uh, one of the contradictions. People can say President Carter was a terrible politician. But he was elected in 1976 as Jimmy Who. No one knew who he was. And he created quite a sensation. So in this case, though, what he believed he should do is achieve things, make the world better. And that's what he did, has done as a former president. And that's what he did as president. One of the amazing things to me is that I still learn about things that he achieved that I didn't realize. For instance, recently, a year or two ago, I learned about President Carter's contributions to the peace in Northern Ireland. John Hume, who was a great champion of peace in Northern Ireland, gives Carter, President Carter great credit for what he did to support the peace process in Northern Ireland during the, his administration. And then another thing that I just learned about a year ago was the achievement of the Refugee Act of 1980. This, he brought the United States into compliance with international law. 
there had been a uh, opposition in the United States to allowing refugees in. But President Carter, as a human rights matter, uh, felt that the United States should follow uh, the international law in being open to refugees. During his administration, there were many refugees left over from via the Vietnamese War and from Cambodia. And President Carter felt a terrible responsibility to them, even though that was before he was president. So he, he had a, a great achievement in that too. And most, hardly anybody has heard of these two things. But uh, the, the topics that are dealt with in the uh, documentary by Will and Jill are the primary ones and they definitely need to be given more credit. Uh, President Carter needs to get more credit for what he achieved. There's so much to learn about him. Well, you know, I and I think we celebrated this uh, at the Carter Library uh, year year and a half ago. Um, he is the one that established the Inspector Generals um, to try and look at possible fraud, mismanagement, waste, and those sort of things, and and keep them independent as a way to to make government better, but. The thing is, there are so many of these pieces about President Carter, and I'm curious for Will and Jim, how did you, how did you, in putting the film together, keep this from being just raw, raw Jimmy Carter? Yeah, that actually, John helped us a good bit with this part. Um, we were close to the end of the process, or we thought. Originally, so originally this film was about three hours long. We said, nobody's going to watch this. Maybe we can make it into a series. Um, we cut about an hour off of it, which, I mean, there's some good cuts in there, like Superfund. We had this really cool section about what he did for Superfund and the EPA and these sort of things. And so we, we chopped, chopped, chopped. And then once we got it down to around the, you know, it was, it was under two hours at that point, we really looked at this idea that we didn't have enough at that point because we had along the way fallen in love with this guy um we didn't have enough of the thing the reasons as to why his presidency didn't ultimately succeed and so we started to reinsert these things and it's one of my favorite parts of the film i mean the film is itself it's inspirational at the same time it's a tragedy and one of my favorite lines in the film is um john's line where he says uh, there's this paradox of American politics where you can only go so far with an entirely pure message. And that really, what for President Carter was kind of the rub. At times, there was this sense that even though he was achieving so much, people didn't really understand that he was actually accomplishing these things because he wasn't his own cheerleader. And it's kind of a sad reality of modern presidents is now along the way, they constantly have to say, look what I'm doing. I'm actually doing things for everybody. Oh, look at this amazing achievement I have. Um, whereas President Carter didn't focus on that. I think in the sense of the film, at the beginning, he's actually very popular for not focusing on these things. And as the film progresses, he doesn't change too much. But at the end, he's not very popular at all. And so you see that it's really the spirit of the American people and the, uh, you know, their own minds that change along the way, not President Carter, which is one of our, you know, it's kind of how we ended up piecing it all together anyways, is just yeah. along the way. Well, a, a question from one of our viewers is, is along that line. And, and for any of you all, what could President Carter have done to have changed that so that the perception was hey, he really did all of this stuff that was good for the country. What, what could he have done to improve that? I'm not sure that there was that much that he could have done on that. Uh, um, you know, so many of these things were in the gearing of, of government. So, for instance, I, I asked a reporter, uh, one of the good reporters, more substantive reporters, whether he'd ever heard of a bill called PERPA, the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act. And 
He said, no. Uh, and, you know, I couldn't blame him. Uh, but in some ways I could blame the press because this was a bill that for the first time allowed incentivized public utilities to use green energy. So think about how significant that is in our world. But at the time, you know, when I, I interviewed after I finished the book, it was too late for the uh, hardcover, so it's in the paperback and the audiobook. I interviewed Barack Obama about Jimmy Carter, and he said, you know, he took these ideas about energy and the environment from the what he called the counter, what Obama called the counterculture, into the mainstream through policy. But at the time, they were still in the counterculture. So if he'd gone out and given a speech and said, I just pushed PERPA through and we're going to let, you know, uh, people who, uh, we're going to let utilities use green energy, it would have been of interest to the people who subscribe to the whole earth catalog and wear, wear sandals. <laughs> you know, it, it just, it, the country wasn't ready for a lot of what he was doing. Or you mentioned inspector generals. So he, he signed the Inspector Generals Act of 1978 and the Ethics and Government Act of 1978 that had the first protection for whistleblowers and the FISA Courts Act. So think whistleblowers, FISA Courts, Inspector Generals. Donald Trump would not have been impeached the first time if it wasn't for these bills that Jimmy Carter got through. But it took, you know, 40 years for the their, you know, benefit for us in, in, in a moment, even though they didn't lead to his removal from office. You know, the country learned about the importance of these structural reforms. And then some other things people are just never going to learn about. And, and it would have been hard for him to brag about. Just to give you an example, like if if uh, some of you now that you've had your vaccinations, you might be able to tonight go out for a beer. Maybe you want a craft beer, let's say. There wouldn't have been any craft beer if it wasn't for Jimmy Carter because he changed the law the big breweries had a stranglehold going back to the 1930s on 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 uh, the uh, brewing of beer and small entries were not allowed into the market basically under very old regulations carter got rid of those but the new craft breweries it took several years until after he was out of office before you could see what he had accomplished human rights is a bit much bigger issue you know it, it eventually contributed to the move in Latin America from dictatorship to democracy in almost every country in Latin America. But that process played out over a dozen years. It didn't happen right after Carter's human rights uh, policy was enacted. Even Camp David, you know, he couldn't really brag that much about Camp David because most people with good reason thought it would fall apart. It already had fallen apart and he'd gone to the Middle East and put the whole thing back together with chewing gum and masking tape, you know, so everybody expected it was going to fall apart again. The fact that it's been the most durable and important peace treaty since World War II, we didn't know that then. So there wouldn't have really been any way for Carter to brag about it uh, all that much. Yeah, well, and, and I was thinking in your, your list of accomplishments that if if he had been allowed to go through with them near the end of his administration, he was discussing climate change. And there was a movement, we need to start studying climate change. And this is 40 years ago. And the, the stories now, if that process, if that study had gone on, uh, if it hadn't been killed uh, during the Reagan administration, might we well, it actually be better off today than. Uh... Yeah. So, Tony, just a couple of things on that. You know, in your library, I found these articles from the journal Nature that Carter was underlining when he was governor. He was interested in climate change when it was strictly in the academic community. And then when he uh, at the end of uh, his presidency, in the last year of his presidency, he had this uh, Global 2000 initiative and he had the Council on Environmental Quality, Gus Speth and the White House do these reports. And they, it wasn't just studying climate change. They recommended, and this is on, on page A13 of the New York Times in 1980, it has this, that uh, emissions go down to uh, 1.5 uh, degrees uh, uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels. Now, wh wh why does that sound familiar? Because that's exactly what the... Paris Climate Accords 
agreed on in 2016. So, you know, this this was policy that had been recommended in 1980. And if he'd been reelected, it adds a real tragic dimension to that 1980 defeat, uh, because if he'd been reelected, he always had followed the Council on Environmental Quality's recommendations on literally dozens of other issues in four years. And so there's no way that having been reelected, he wouldn't have followed their recommendations. Now, would that have gotten us off fossil fuel in 1982? No, you know, we still needed energy independence and coal and it wouldn't have, but it would have begun the process. And he wanted hybrids, hybrid cars by the middle 1980s, uh, the middle of the 1980s. And that was also, you know, in the documents that they were producing at the end of his presidency. Yeah, um, I want to get to a few of the questions before we run out of time. And and Dr. Strong, this is probably uh, best for you. Uh, a viewer writes he's he's wondering about the uh, the atrocities in Com uh, uh, Cambodia that happened in the late seventies under Paul Pot, and whether Carter could have done anything uh, about that uh, other than go to war, like start another Vietnam? Uh, that's not a topic I can help you with uh, a great deal. It's, uh, it's an excellent question, uh, because uh, what happens in the aftermath of uh, our defeat uh, in uh, Vietnam uh, carries uh, a very high price uh, in uh, Cambodia. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't uh, tell you maybe uh, Jonathan uh, can. Um, I, I did want to come back to that earlier question from one of the viewers. Um, what could he have done differently? A lot of political scientists give the answer that won't surprise people who have listened to us. Do less. Uh, if you don't do as many big controversial things, uh, you may be in a better position to win the second term when you can take those things on. There were a number of things on Jimmy Carter's to-do list that political advisors told him, well, that's a second term issue. Uh, you can do it, uh, but you can't do it if you're planning to be reelected in, uh, in 1980. Um, uh, Carter heard that advice. Uh, he trusted the people who were giving him that advice. It sometimes included his wife, um, but he didn't take it uh, and uh, uh, plowed ahead uh, with all the things he tried to accomplish. Part of his failure to win a second term was his decision to do that. So, uh, just to answer the, the, the question, I completely agree with, uh, with what uh, Dr. Strong just said. Um, the you know, there were a number of things that he could have done differently, P probably shouldn't in retrospect have boycotted the Olympics. Grain embargo was a terrible mistake uh, in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan because they, uh, the Soviets just uh, were able to get grain from other countries very easily. It didn't hurt them and it, it uh, did a lot of damage in the farm belt in the United States to no, no effect. And the Olympic boycott, which had been very popular when Carter announced it, um, turned out to be very unpopular and I don't think accomplished a whole lot. And those lessons are being learned. We're not gonna boycott the uh, Chinese Olympics uh, next year, um, in part in consequence of, of uh, Carter's decision. On, on Cambodia, I, I got very interested in this and, and discussed it with, with Carter. Um, so uh, the Vietnamese drove uh, Pol Pot out so Carter um, and Carter was, you know, denouncing the genocide in Cambodia uh, early in his presidency. Um, it, it wasn't that. It was that after Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge were out of power, uh, larger strategic interests, our interests in staying in league with our allies and with China, which we haven't discussed Carter normalized relations with China, which he believes will be the longest lasting of all of his major decisions, because that bilateral relationship 
with the United States that he established is now the foundation of the global economy. But at that time, it was a more fragile thing. And so Deng Xiaoping, the Australians, a bunch of other allies, they wanted to support ceding the Khmer Rouge and you know Pol Pot's uh, genocidal outfit in the UN over the puppet government that Vietnam had put in the puppet Cambodian government. And Carter went along with that. And I, I still find that just a, a really unfortunate decision. I know it was a difficult one for him. I think it, he still struggles with having made that decision. It didn't have hugely negative consequences, but it, it clearly was the wrong decision and inconsistent with his, his larger success on human rights. His human rights policy was hypocritical. I mean, he supported the Shah of Iran, he supported uh, Marcos in the Philippines, but you know the good that it did, uh, both in bringing uh, using soft power to erode the Soviet Union, and in you know a democratic revolution in many other parts of the world, uh, in Asia as well. The good that it did is 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 a huge a huge part of his his often unexamined legacy. Um, because we've only got a few minutes left, I, I want to ask the same question of, of all of you that one of our, our viewers was asking, and that is, could a President Carter be elected today in this kind of climate, in this kind of fundraising uh, and time of PACs? Uh, could, could a could there be another Jimmy Carter in the White House? And and John, you were just up, so let's let's start with you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, I think you could. I mean, when when Donald Trump was president, we we thought, oh, you know, we always project out to the future. Oh, you know, we're never going to get anybody uh, with any sense of morality or honesty again. And and we now have a president who's basically honest. So. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, possible um, that we could have another another uh, Jimmy Carter type uh, figure. But, um, you know, that person, I think, to succeed and to get through the, the process it will have to um, master the political dimension to being president. And Carter understands this. I mean, he said he told me at one point that his failure to maintain his relationships inside the Democratic Party was his biggest regret um, about his presidency. I mean, I think his, his actual biggest regret is that he didn't get a comprehensive Middle East peace, which he wanted in a second term, you know, uh, the Palestinian homeland. Uh, but uh, in terms of, you know, where he, I mean, I don't think, for instance, a lot of people, including me, think he made a terrible mistake letting the Shah of Iran into the United States for medical treatment because that's what kicked off, uh, you know, the the seizure of the hostages. But he, he does did, too. He yeah. thinks that, that was a terrible mistake. Yeah, about. yeah, he does too. But but he's not. Um, I, I I just think in answer to your question, I I don't think that it's it's impossible that somebody else with a strong moral streak can come along and and it's it's interesting that joe biden was his first supporter in the u.s senate and in 1980 when a lot of senators were going with ted kennedy who was very popular biden stayed loyal to carter i think there was a even though they they disagreed on a couple of big things they uh you know there, there was a connection there that i think does uh, stem from a sense of empathy and morality that they share. So the answer to your question is yes, we can get and maybe have gotten another Jimmy Carter. Let Dr. Strong? Yeah. Me, well, let me just, just briefly, briefly. Uh, I think that uh, there's potential, but what President Carter warned about in the documentary is money. Would someone like Jimmy Carter be able to raise the incredible amounts of money that people have to have today. So that that's my reservation, money. Just, Steve, I just super quickly, I think yes, because now, you know, people in 2020 was such a horrible election in so many ways. 
people didn't notice there was this really good news, which the dawn of the small donor. Hmm. There were hundreds of thousands of millions of small donors. And if and, and Obama got a lot. So big money is still powerful, but it can be matched with small donations. And I think Carter, you know, and you know, got a lot of small donations in 76. And if he was running now, he he probably would as well. And I would just add that uh, when the American public gets frustrated with Washington and sick of both political parties, there is an open door for uh, the real dark horse, the real outsider to come along. And not all of those people uh, are going to turn out to be uh, terrible human beings. Uh, There could be a virtuous populist in America's uh, future uh, probably someone who we could not name today, uh, but w- might well have the capacity to come forward and do what Carter did in 1976. Yeah. Will? Yeah, I, I, I think I like what um, everybody said there. I really think that at this point in time, when you look at, we've called him the first millennial president, Jason Carter calls him the first millennial president all of the issues that were appealing to folks back then for President Carter, or at least many of them, are kind of in a way, sadly, still very relevant today because they haven't been tackled. Um, so I think I think a guy like him could definitely win again. And Jim, I, I, I guess it's really um, by showing people what you can have in terms of uh, leadership, that's, that's what your film shows it is it, it, it's what the film's about i think you know I'm, I'm hopeful john's book is is you know doing a lot to to put that out there and show people that that we've actually had this kind of leadership in the past which you know one would think means we can have it uh, again in in the future um i think also you know i'd point to i think he appeared on stephen colbert's show a couple years back and um colbert brings out a t-shirt that says you know that he gives to Carter and says still constitutionally eligible. Um, and I think, I think that's, you know, it was kind of a joke, but, but because Carter did stand for a lot of the things that, that people really do care about today. And so, yeah, I do believe that a, that a Jimmy Carter um, could win, um, you know, in, in today's day and age. And, and I think, um, like John said, with, with the small dollar donors and things like that, I, I think that that is hopefully making a difference. And, and yeah, I think people want honesty and, and, and Biden and Carter do sh- kind of share those similarities that uh, John was touching on it. Biden was actually, you know, he was talking intimately with Carter when he was president, you know, about, um, about Kennedy's uh, challenge to him. Um, young Senator Biden was was kind of uh, feeding Carter information, as it were, and and but it was because they shared this sense of, of morality, and so um, I think uh, yeah, I, I think we're kind of seeing it today, and I'm hopeful about it going forward. The film is called Carter Land. It will premiere at the Atlanta Film Festival on April 24th at the Carter Presidential Center. Uh, you can get uh, tickets and more information at atlantafilmfestival.com. I want to thank Jim and Will, Jonathan, Dr. Strong, and Steve Hockman. This has been, the hour has gone by very quickly, uh, but it has really been nice to look back at the, at the Carter presidency and, and all that it was and all that it, it was accomplished. And we thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you all and have a good evening.